Jeffrey Epstein told everyone exactly the type of man he was, and in return, they told him their deepest, darkest secrets. And because money can wipe away the dirtiest of deeds, the tide, the tide will always bring them back to the surface. I realize what I am. I'm very comfortable in my own position. I'm so excited about this uh, special that is uh, on the blaze. You can you can find it if you're a fan of Chad Prather. Uh, you've probably heard him talk about it already. Uh, but if if you don't know who Chad Prather is, and I want to know how you get this title, he's an American humorist. <laughs> That's what you're classified as, an American humorist. Uh, and uh, he's well known online for his commentary, just sitting in the cab of his truck. Uh, with his hat, which he's not wearing his hat today, and you're almost unrecognizable. I am. I'm channeling my inner Glenn Beck. Is what I'm doing. With is that all what these it layers is? Layers and the sweater yeah, and the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, this yeah. Arctic temperature that you keep in the yeah in the building here. Yeah. <laughs> so, Pratt, uh, uh, Chad, you. Um, that's Pratt's a, a good summary. Pratt, of your it's a summary of you. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, Chad, you did uh, a three-part special on uh, Epstein when you started it. Did you think that he killed himself? Did you think it was uh, a cover-up? What did you think going into it? I did. I honestly did not know. I don't know that I had an opinion, but the further I got into it, the more questions that were raised. Like right now, if I was a betting man and had to put $1,000 on the line, I would probably take the bet that he killed himself. But let me raise some questions for you because when we get into this special, everybody knows the 2008 sex offender who is convicted 13 months of probation he goes to and he goes to when he does go to jail they leave the door unlocked because he claims to be claustrophobic he gets to go to his office 12 hours a day he pays the west palm beach uh sheriff's, sheriff's office one hundred twenty eight thousand dollars so they can put a tv in the attorney's room all of these little favors it's that he crazy. gets he makes off-duty police officers wear a suit in order to check in his guests he pays their salary uh, so that he can do business while he's in jail. We know that guy. He's a creep. What we don't realize is after that, a guy who tries to reinvent himself, who basically gets a ranch in New Mexico because he doesn't have to register as a sex offender there. It's in the middle of the King Ranch, which is not to be confused with the King Ranch in Texas. This is Bruce King. This is the governor of New Mexico, the family which passes down um, political titles and positions like family heirlooms, and he's right in the middle of their property. You can't go. Did he buy their property uh, to create? He got this a rent? little sweetheart deal from them. He buys ten thousand acres, builds a an almost twenty eight thousand square foot home there. He calls it a ranch. It's not a ranch. Uh, the the people around the area thought that the owner of Victoria's Secret owned it because of the rotating models that were coming in and out of these young girls that are coming in and out of the place. But why New Mexico, beyond being able to get away with not identifying as a sex offender, it's close to a lot of different facilities where there's cryogenics, transhumanism, there is uh, all of the scientific things that are going on. For instance, there was a group that was collecting the sperm of Nobel Prize winners in order to create a new generation of smart people. Epstein bought into this idea, and his idea, along with his accomplice, Jelaine Maxwell, who is still very much alive, still very much at large, and has never been questioned by authorities, they concoct the idea of bringing in 20 young girls at a time, impregnating them with Jeffrey Epstein's seed, and signing away all rights to the progeny, the baby, and they're going to raise on this compound and create a whole new generation this of is, Epstein. This is honestly master race kind of stuff. This is big stuff. So this is a guy who is obsessed. This is after he's already been this, in jail. Exactly. This is a whole. This is a guy reinventing himself. This is the guy who's donating millions of dollars to Harvard. This is a guy who's donating to MIT. This is a guy who is a college dropout who is now sitting – almost as though he is a colleague with these doctors from Harvard in these science programs, and they're treating him like an equal. This is a guy who's welcoming cohorts like Bill Gates and um, um, Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. who think of him as just harebrained, but they love the fact that he's got all this influence, right? So 
he's concocting this deal. And so you talk about conspiracy theories. This is fact. This is known fact. This guy is wanting to recreate himself. He wanted to have his head and his penis cryogenically frozen so that he could bring him back to life one day. Here was a guy obsessed with immortality. So now back to your original question, did he commit suicide? Why would a man so obsessed with immortality kill himself? Genesis 9.50, my favorite. I love them, boy. Use it on everything. Genesis 9.50, don't go out spending money replacing carpet and getting a whole bunch of new stuff for your house. Use Genesis 9.50. I want you to go to Genesis950.com. I got a deal for you. They're going to get rid of the stains, get rid of the odors in the carpet. You got pets that are pooping, it'll get rid of it. I'm telling you, it's get, it'll get deep down into the carpet and the pad. Antibacterial, it is green. You don't have to worry about it harming your safe, uh, your your family, safe for your family. For you, you don't have to worry about harming your pets. But gallon of it, one gallon of Genesis 950 is going to make seven gallons. If you got some old stains, some stuff you really need to get, why not? Hey, before you go, why? I mean, if you're going to buy something anyway, why don't you just try to clean it? And invest in the good stuff. That my daddy taught me that. My dad said, like my dad was one of those impulse buyers. He knew what he wanted, but when he went out and got it, he got the best. You know, he like this is going to last me for the rest of my life. I'm gonna buy a shotgun. It's gonna be the only shotgun I ever own, right? That kind of yeah. thing. I don't have that mindset. But listen, don't start replacing your stuff. Clean it. Any surface in your house, countertops, granite quartz, garage floors, oil grease stains. Put it on your car, your wheels, your your tools. Clean your stuff. Get it. Get it. Go to Genesis950.com. Don't go anywhere else to get this stuff because they're going to send you a free spray bottle discount using the Blaze. You use B-L-A-Z-E in the discount code. You're going to get a discount. Genesis950.com. Genesis950.com! Why would a guy who, even when he was in jail most recently after his arrest six months ago, still be buying commissary favors from fellow inmates? Here's a guy who said that after his first, quote, suicide attempt, he said, I didn't try to commit suicide. My cellmate attacked me. So we can look at all of the different things between the, the, the video cameras being off, the lapse in time, the, the, the doctored logs with the prison guards, the people who did not watch him. Why was he left alone in his cell? Is it possible that, that he was murdered? Why is a guy who, who he already got off once, Glenn, why doesn't he get off now? And if he's going to kill himself, why doesn't he just make a phone call? So my question is, okay, let's say he killed himself. Well, there had to be a reason. Had to be a reason why he killed himself. So if he did that, then somebody was putting so much pressure on him, in essence saying, we're going to make your life a veritable hell if you don't do it to yourself. Like, we'll skin you alive kind of thing. Mm-hmm. We'll put you in a pot of boiling oil you're gonna suffer (laughs) why wouldn't he just make one phone call and say i have all the news that you want now we saw in on abc amy robach she sits there on the hot mic moment and she says i had it all it was the most prolific case of of pedophilia we've ever known this would have been the story of the century this would have exposed more people than anything we've ever known uh, and the key is Epstein was ready to talk. So if he killed himself, why didn't he talk? He could have made one phone call. He's already beaten it once. Yeah, but you are yeah. looking at when, when you get to suicide, um, my feeling is that it is the, the final and the greatest act of insanity. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So you can't necessarily apply... If a guy sees his world completely collapsing and he's convinced there's no way out, there's no way out, and he has some loyalty to some of the people that were helping him, he might think it's better this way. Now, I don't know if, he, I mean, it seems so, so, so many, many coincidences yeah, yeah. happened yeah. that there are real questions. I'm like you. If I had to bet, I would still bet that he did it himself, but mm-hmm. I'm not betting more than I'm probably not <laughs> betting more than 500 bucks on that. You know what I mean? Because so, I don't know. So let's look at this thing because uh, you, you you look at the BBC interview with Prince Andrew, 
who now the queen is basically disowning. And I, I feel like they're trying to put out a carpet fire with a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> I mean, they just kind of trotted him out there and said, you do your best, Andy, mm -hmm. because this BBC interview just made him look worse and worse and worse. And now, they canceled his birthday party. They canceled, they his, canceled and, his And remember, birthday party. on the BBC <laughs> interview, this is a guy who said, I don't like to party. I don't party. And I don't know if we have that clip of what I call party boy Prince Andrew. If we have time to show it and Here Steve it has got it pulled up, take a look at this. But he had the most extraordinary um, ability to bring um, uh, extraordinary people together. Uh, and that's the bit that I remember is going to the dinner parties where you would meet academics, politicians, people from the United Nations. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a cosmopolitan group of what I would describe as, as U.S. Um, eminence. But was that his appeal then? Was yeah. that what you... Because you, you were perceived by the public as being the party prince. Was that something well, you I shared? Well, I think that's um, also um, a bit of a stretch. Um, I don't know why I've, I've, I've um, uh, collected that title, because I don't... I, I never have really parted. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you're wow. just listening to this on radio, you're missing... All of the <laughs> pictures of women licking his face at a party and everything else. Was that something you added, Chad, or is that from the BBC interview? <laughs> That's from the BBC oh interview, my God, which is classic. I mean, they wow. threw him under the bus. Yeah. And by the way, Virginia Roberts, who, of course, there's the famous picture of him with his arm around mm -hmm. the then 17-year-old Virginia Roberts, who, who, by the way, took off to Thailand. Uh, she, you know, Jelaine Maxwell take, and Jeffrey Epstein take her to London, wake her up one morning and say, today you're going to meet a prince. Talking about, of course, Prince Andrew. Then there's this now, this picture out there, which, of course, they have said, uh, it's, a, it's a false picture, Photoshop. Photoshop had really not been out that long whenever this picture had, I mean, it was not, it, and you it was can a lot tell. of things. Yeah, you yeah. can tell if it's Photoshop. And here's the thing, there's nothing wrong legally with this picture. No. I mean, you've put your arm around somebody's niece, mm -hmm. you know, you've done, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong, there's nothing he illegal. He does it in a little bit of a, like a little grabby way. Yeah, you know, I mean, she's wearing hair. a halter top yeah. thing, there's some exposed midriff, and his but, hand is right there. You could, could see be, the could flash the way. in the window. And so we could we could analyze the picture, but at the end of the day, of course, yeah, I can explain this away. I'm not going to go over and over and go, that's not me, that's not me. Obviously, we know Andrew is the party prince. You saw the pictures that mm -hmm. are there. And that's why I look at this and I think, because you, you brought up the point, Glenn, you said if his whole world is crumbling down, was it? We don't know. Uh, he's already gotten out once. There are... There are plea deals that, to, that are there to be made if he wanted to do it, if you really want to truly expose some people that are involved in this. Now, because who's Jeffrey Epstein? Five years ago, did anybody, did the average American really know who Jeffrey Epstein was? No, no of course. It's this conspiracy idea and the, and the drama around it that has made him basically a household name. He's now a nonstop memes. We've, we've made jokes about this thing. And let me, let me be real clear because I've gotten accusations here of people saying, well, it's almost like you're feeling sorry for the guy. No, I'm glad he's dead. Let me, let me just be real clear. I'm glad the guy, the earth is a better place without mm -hmm. Jeffrey Epstein in it. But here's the thing. How many more Epstein-esque influencers are out there, people like Jelaine Maxwell, who was the queen to his king on the chessboard, who orchestrated all these things, who took a Virginia Roberts, which, by the way, we had it lined up for Virginia Roberts to come on the show via Skype from Australia. Because wow. what, I, what I started to say earlier, Stu, is that they she went to Thailand uh, for, long story short, Epstein sends her to Thailand and says, bring me back a young girl. She gets over there, and within five days, she meets her now husband, who's from Australia. He takes her to Australia and basically gets her out of this Epstein world that's there. Because she was... She was project number one in New Mexico in terms of who they were going to impregnate. She was going to be the experimental test case. So Virginia Roberts, of course, who is seen as 17 years old in this picture with Prince Andrew, she's the one, and they basically put a gag order on her. Tonight there will be a BBC interview with her that comes mm. out. So we couldn't get her. She had to cancel for us. But we did talk to her on the phone. It's quite compelling when you when you see what was All going right. on. Uh, hang on just a sec, because I would like to hear a little bit more of what, sure. what we know for fact mm -hmm what was happening on this this ranch chad what did you find out about what really has happened or ha did they impregnate any of these girls in in new mexico not that, we, not that we know of not that anybody that that we can verify so i'm assuming no uh this was the plan though and when we get into the special 
We take the first episode to really build a case because there's a huge cast of characters that are there. And what my producer, Candace Ortiz, did is... Great job she, by Candace. By she's way. incredible. She's incredible. Mm -hmm. I told her, I said, you can never leave me. She's, she's just amazing <laughs> with the research that she does. But she likened it to a chessboard. Of course, Epstein being the king, Jelaine Maxwell being the queen. And so we build this cast of characters that are out there. And then we, the, we it builds kind of into a crescendo force as we get to the third episode. And people are just kind of left with their mouths wide open because it's amazing. Not only the – so here's a guy. This was not about money. Because that's what people go to. They say, well, here's a billionaire. Of course, he could do anything he wanted to do. So it's not about money. The man who was a college dropout, who was at Bear Stearns for one year, he, he couldn't even teach high school physics right. or math at the Danbury School in New York, which is a prestigious school. He, now, now he's sitting there with Harvard scientists. He's sitting there with MIT scientists. He's talking with some of the top innovators well he was doing that because he was trying to recast himself as exactly an innovator as somebody who uh, who was a patron right of in innovation and science right and and you look at this guy who's trying to reinvent himself he was buying influence right so bill gates did not need jeffrey epstein's money but his influence seems pretty appealing the same with an elon musk a Stephen Hawking, and at no time do we take any of these people and accuse them of pedophilia or anything like that because that's naturally where the human brain goes to. What we're doing is pointing out why would you, why would you hang out, and that was the question brought up by the BBC to Prince Andrew, why would you continue to associate with this man that is, and listen, the news media has consistently come out, and this is the way they describe him, financier and sex offender. Financier and sex offender. Why in that order? Why would you legitimize <laughs> him first by saying he's a financier and then say, oh, and by the way, he's a sex offender? Mm -hmm. Every news media outlet, every print outlet continu continues to do that. We've even done it here at The Blaze. And, he, and it's one of those things where it's like, no, this guy was a pedophile. No question about it. We know this for a fact. And Andrew he was did hanging out with him at his house after the conviction, too, which was one of the big... Issues, right? And I think it's we have a clip of that as well. Oh. Stephen wants to run it. This is a pretty interesting little clip here because he's questioned by the interviewer here as to why would you continue to stay at this 41-bedroom mansion, the largest individually owned residence, which, by the way, there's never any evidence that he ever bought this penthouse in Manhattan. Oh, that's weird. East Side. And so pretty interesting story. Here's the, here's the clip. Yeah. He threw a party to he's celebrate his release, and you were invited as no, the guest go. of honor. Oh, in 2010, that there wasn't, certainly wasn't a, a, a party to celebrate his release in December, because it was a small dinner party. There were only eight or 10 of us, I think, at the, at the, at the dinner. If there, was, if there was a party, then I'd know nothing about that. Y you were invited to that dinner as a guest of honor. Well, I was there, so there was a dinner. I don't think it was quite as, as you might put it, but yeah, okay, I was there for a, <laughs> I was there at dinner, yeah. I'm just trying to work this out because you said you went to break up the relationship and yet you stayed at that New York mansion several days. I'm wondering how yeah, long... But I was would... doing a number of other things while I was there. But you were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. been talking about precious metals for a long time now because I really believe it is smart to have tangible assets as a part of your personal portfolio. Obviously, I believe in all the companies that sponsor this show, but you've heard me talk about GMR Gold even before I uh, even before I had this show on Blaze TV because I've been using them for a while now. They have something called the Bullion Box, which is an awesome way to slowly get into precious metals. It's a monthly subscription box delivered directly to you from the comfort and convenience of your own home. And what you get to do, and this is what I love about it, no matter what your budget, no matter where you're at in life, look, you get to choose from five different levels designed to fit that budget. Your metals are handpicked 
by their bullion team with nearly 100 years of combined experience. It's fun, people, I'm telling you. You're going to love when it shows up every month. There's no hidden fees. You can cancel it anytime. You can even give a bullion box subscription as a gift. And look, that's a great Christmas gift. You can talk about it over the turkey. Hey, what'd you get? They say, you know, well, we got this. I got this coin. I got this silver. I got this gold. I got all this. It's fun to compare the notes on your bullion boxes. So go to gmrbox.com. That's gmrbox.com. Go there today and join the club. I want you to remember that Jeffrey Epstein was not just some guy that happened by happenstance or accident. He was a grandmaster of manipulation. He loved playing chess. I don't know if you know that or not. He was a chess player, and he treated his life just like a game of chess, and his subsequent acquaintances in his life were just like the chess pieces, right? So these people, these powerful, powerful people in his life, he moved them around. He manipulated them just like moving chess pieces on the board, and he made sure that everything he did was done in his favor. So the rise of Jeffrey Epstein was a very deliberate, very slow, very incremental climb. And I want to show you how this guy rose to be one of the most powerful people in the world that, for the most part, you probably never heard of until recent days. He was quite literally one of the darkest people that history has ever known, and certainly in this country. And what you don't understand is Jeffrey Epstein was very clear. He told people exactly who he was. He didn't hide who he was. He never shied away from his dark side. He did everything he could to normalize his crazy, crazy mental psychosis. He was quite literally the Bobby Fisher of power, money, and pedophilia. If you consider a chessboard, the bishop stands close guard on either side of the king and the queen. They're the third most powerful piece on the chessboard. They can make they can make a lot of diagonal moves and they represent a huge influence in power. He had two specific bishops. Their names Les Wexner and Stephen Hoffenberg. Now, these guys it, I, it, Every time I see any pictures of, of first of all Epstein and these guys, I just want to punch him in the face. I want to punch myself in the face. Because I, you look at these guys and you're like who are these slimy creeps, right? You take Stephen Hoffenberg. Stevens introduced Epstein in the early 1980s. These guys, they become fast friends, which ought to tell you something about the, the, how, the shenanigans going on here. I mean, these guys, they're just about making the money. Stephen owns a powerful financial firm called Towers Financial. And in and around the 1980s, Stephen is going to hire Epstein. And together, they're going to do all kind of attempts at big business so like they failed uh, at various different business ventures not the least of which was a failed purchase of the dying pan am airlines remember pan am uh, some of you might be too young but many of you out there listening you remember pan am jeff epstein trying to buy it later they're both going to conduct the largest ponzi scheme in u.s history and that's going to include embezzlement tax evasion taking money from widows and taking money from retirees this is this is crazy, Candace. Like, this just tells you, you know, you know how the, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil? Mm -hmm. You can't get more evil than a Jeffrey Epstein. Of course. And so when he teamed up with Stephen Hoffenberg, from what we've researched and what we can understand, Stephen already had this idea, but he needed someone to help facilitate it. And that's where Jeffrey Epstein came in. He always referred to him as the architect of this whole scheme. And that will come into handy when this goes to court, and it's just going to prove that Epstein can basically snake his way out of any situation, yeah, no matter what. Yeah, he's slippery. What. He's slippery. Because they come up with a grand total of over $460 million. Four, that's, I mean, half a billion dollars. And it's rumored to be the foundation. This amount of money is basically the foundation for what ultimately becomes Epstein's vast 
fortune, right? Mm -hmm. So during this period of time, Epstein, he's going to become the senior VP at Towers Financial. And like you said, he's the he's the face man, right? He's the charismatic guy. He's he's the guy who's out there moving and shaking. He's the hustler. And so in 1990, there's this full scale investigation that gets underway regarding Tower Financial and the Hoff and and the, you know the Hoffenberg, which during this investigation and the trial that follows, guess what? Hoffenberg. <laughs> Hoffenberg, who calls Epstein, like you mentioned, the architect of the scam, Epstein's never even questioned, never brought to testify, and never charged. Hoffenberg's going to plead guilty, and he's going to do it all by himself after being swindled by the Federal District Court of Manhattan to take a plea deal all by himself. Where's Epstein? Where's Epstein? He's out of the picture. Nobody. He's all by himself. But guess what? <laughs> oh, that federal district court of Manhattan. You know what? Who served on that federal district court? Well, all of them had been appointed by then President William Clinton. Bill Clinton. Hoffenberg's going to serve 18 years in jail. Jeffrey Epstein is going to serve exactly zero. The bishop has sacrificed himself for the king. There's another bishop, Les Wexner. Now, Les is the owner and CEO of companies like Bath & Body Works, The Limited, Victoria's Secret. I mean, you know, some small companies out there, right? He meets Epstein through the aforementioned J. Epstein and Company, and one of Wexner's friends facilitates the meeting. So Wexner is looking for a financial advisor for his multi-million dollar bank account. Epstein says, you know what? I only talk to millionaires, and apparently you got a bunch of them. So let's sit down and have a little chat. Epstein offers his services, and guess what? He soon finds himself in control of the entirety of Les Wexner's wealth. You would think that people who make this kind of money wouldn't be this dumb, right? You would, one would think, but that's how smooth Epstein is. And they were so willing and ready to trust him with everything, yeah. which is only going to be a reoccurring pattern as the years move on, even up until last year. Hey, imagine your cell phone is a voting booth, and every time you make a call or use your phone, you're voting for impeachment, open borders, gun confiscation, or abortion. It's a horrible thought, but that's essentially what you are doing whenever you spend money with cell phone companies that hate everything you believe in. <laughs> Listen, add insult to injury on that, and these cell phone character carriers have all kinds of hidden fees, like AT&T's administrative fees that they're currently getting sued over. Compare that with Patriot Mobile, the nation's only conservative phone company who is not only supporting your values with no hidden fees, but for a limited time, giving you a free Moto Z3 when you open a new line. That's right. You heard me correct. You will get a free phone. And Moto Z3, this offer is only valid through Cyber Monday when you call 877-367-7524. Switching is easy. You're going to get reliable 4G LTE nationwide service for as low as $25 a month while helping to preserve the country we all love. So go to patriotmobile.com slash beck patriotmobile.com slash Beck or call their U.S.-based team 877-367-7524 that's 877-367-7524 He had a hypnotic ability like he could put people into a trance just to trust him, believe him, and he just took everything they had. So not only does he have the full full entirety of Wexner's wealth under his thumb, he's given power to borrow money, make investments, sign tax returns, and even hire people all under Wexner's name. This is crazy. He even went so far as replacing Wexner's own mother on his company's advisory board. So Epstein basically views Wexner 
as a mentor, but he's soon <laughs> he's soon going to use them to grow his own assets because less less the original owner of that uh, that sprawling New York mansion that we've discussed that that you that Epstein called home. You know, the seven-story, 41-bedroom, 21,000-square-foot home is somehow transferred over to Epstein by Wexner in 1996 as Wexner and his wife were moving to Ohio. Now, you told me, Candace, this, was, this used to be a private school. Yes. So in its uh, like original state, it served as a private school. And then sometime in the early 70s, I believe, it was revamped into a home by Wexter. And it's considered one of, if not the largest private homes in New York City. Yeah. It's incredible. So, like it said, um, he just somehow happened to get the deed of the house in his name. But that's never really been proven that there was any exchange of funds or anything. Wexner kind of just leaves the house in Epstein's care and goes to Ohio and Epstein kind of moves in basically like squatting in the residence. Yeah. He takes over and there's never any evidence that he legally owns this place. 41 bedrooms, 21,000 square feet. I mean, the guy moves into a a hotel basically. Uh and and obviously, you know, here's the thing about money. If <laughs> if you acquire it without earning it, without working for it, one of the things you're going to do is you're going to abuse it. See, people don't value the things they don't invest in. For him, money was a tool to get to the influence. For him, the investment for Epstein was about the influence. So obviously, when you're in a situation like this where where Les Wexner is making you uh, basically heir apparent to all of this wealth and you've got access to it, you're going to abuse the power. And and he's going to do it with not only Wexner, but he's going to do it with the companies that he ran. So during this time... You got Epstein, whose personal wealth is going to skyrocket. He's even going to obtain a private plane, which is not just a, one, one of these little King Air jets. No, he gets a Boeing 747. I mean, this this is absolutely crazy. He gets a luxurious estate in Ohio and the infamous little St. James Island in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So in 96... Epstein's attempting to become part of yet another one of Wexner's company. Guess what he's doing? Guess what he's doing, people? He's scouting lingerie models for Victoria's Secret. Hey, imagine your cell phone is a voting booth, and every time you make a call or use your phone, you're voting for impeachment, open borders, gun confiscation, or abortion. It's a horrible thought, but that's essentially what you are doing whenever you spend money with cell phone companies that hate everything you believe in. <laughs> Listen, add insult to injury on that, and these cell phone character carriers have all kinds of hidden fees, like AT&T, AT&T's administrative fees that they're currently getting sued over. Compare that with Patriot Mobile, the nation's only conservative phone company who is not only supporting your values with no hidden fees, but for a limited time, giving you a free Moto Z3 when you open a new line. That's right. You heard me correct. You will get a free phone. A Moto Z3, this offer is only valid through Cyber Monday when you call 877-367-7524. Switching is easy. You're going to get reliable 4G LTE nationwide service for as low as $25 a month while helping to preserve the country we all love. So go to patriotmobile.com slash beck patriotmobile.com slash Beck or call their U.S. based team 877-367-7524 that's Epstein posed several times as a recruiting and even as a recruiter and even lured several girls to hotel rooms with a shot of making it in the coveted catalog. I mean, this is casting couch stuff here. 
I mean, we're getting into, we're getting, we're starting to see some of the true intentions emerge. And what is this, like the fourth time that somebody could have stepped in and, and shut it down? Yeah. And another interesting, like, thing that I learned during the research was that when him and Hoffenberg were still kind of formulating their Ponzi scheme, they were going around to widows and retirees and basically saying, like, you have so much money that it's dangerous because once you get to a certain amount of wealth, you start to lose track of it. So if someone takes it from you, how are you to know? You have too much of it. So that's what we're going to help you with. We're going to help keep an eye on your assets. Basically, that's what he did with Les Wexner. Because Les had so much money, he was slowly taking chunks for himself. Yeah, Les, you don't need that much money. Right. That's too much money, Les. You don't need another Boeing 40, <laughs> 747. We got it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, who needs that kind of stuff? And what's funny about this, this stuff's going on. Like, this is hitting its pinnacle here in in uh, 96. And Wexner, when he finds out what's going on, when he finds out about uh, his, Epstein's overstep, well, he, he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cut ties with him. But guess what? It wasn't in two, until 2008 that Wexner decides to officially renounce his association with Epstein. This is 12 years later after he was charged with molestation and soliciting prostitution and sexual activity with a minor. <laughs> these are all these opportunities to shut this down. This guy is a snake in the grass, and he's hiding in plain sight. Now, those of you who know that uh, the king has to have his queen, right? Queen is obviously uh, the, while not the most important piece on the board, the most powerful. And his queen, Jeffrey Epstein's queen, is a woman by the name of Ghislaine Maxwell. So in the chess game, obviously, powerful piece. She can move any direction she wants to move. She can move as many squares as she desires. And her job is to protect the king at all costs. So Jelaine Maxwell, she's this, who is she? She's this wealthy British socialite. She's got tons of money to burn. Oh, you want to talk about a target. Here she comes. She's the daughter of a British media tycoon, Robert Maxwell, a graduate from, from Oxford. Uh, a lot of people question how she was able to even fall in love with and stand by a guy like Epstein. But she not only did it, she did it for years, all the way up until the end, probably, probably because... Jeffrey Epstein reminded her of her own father because Robert Maxwell, here's a guy who lived the life of a rich man with an infatuation for young women. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it, Candace? It does. Yeah. So he had established this public family with a wife and nine children. Ghislaine was the youngest and seemingly, um, seemingly she might have even been the favorite correct yeah uh but he's a pedophile robert maxwell her father is a pedophile he was in the habit of um, after lunch sending for a girl who would come to his sitting room and the doors would be locked from the inside it suggested to me and others um that were close to rm that it was just a i don't know fantasy relationship with these young girls and afterwards i understood that presents were given to the girls yes what sort of presents jewelry this is sort of thank you presents thank you presents yes and when i say that Ghislaine was probably his favorite child he named his favorite yacht after her he named it lady Ghislaine. now uh in 1990 he, he died on that boat or actually off that boat because he fell from an overlooked spot and he was stark naked into the waters of the canary islands Maybe it was a heart attack. A lot of people still think it was a suicide or even a murder. But here's the thing. It's only after Robert's death, as Candace alluded to, that they realize that this guy not only is a pedophile, but he's a fraudster. He's bankrolled most of his life using the pensions of his employees. This is craziness, Candace. Like, you've heard me say over and over again on this show that when you say names like the Trumps or the Clintons and all this, you think those are the power players. Those aren't the power players. There are people out there that are, that are moving and shaking in this world that we have no idea how deep and dark it is. It's absolutely insane, this stuff. It's absolutely insane. So here's this other 
large fortune that's providing this very lush inheritance to all nine of Robert Maxwell's children, each one of them. Now, wouldn't you like to be a part of this? Each one of them receive a trust fund of $100,000 a year for the remainder of their lives. Now, Ghislaine, she could have taken that money. She could have lived a private, normal life. Instead, guess what she does? She moves to New York City. She decides she wants to build upon the wealth through real estate. And in 1991, Ghislaine lands in New York, and the rumor of a young, beautiful, rich British socialite in search of a beneficiary for her assets suddenly travels all the way through Manhattan into the ears of a man by the name of Jeffrey Epstein. They become friends. They become lovers. They become a couple. And after many years, apparently the romance fades, but the two remain close friends and they remain allies. They remain together for the rest of Epstein's life. She becomes basically an advisory figure to Jeff Epstein, which is later going to develop into helping keep a rotating list of girls for Epstein. Now, Ghislaine, she claims to be a licensed helicopter pilot, certified EMT, a deep water submersible pilot. I mean, this girl, the list just rolls on all these things that she's claiming to be. So in 2013, she found, founds, she founded this thing called the Terra Mar Project, which is here is another eye roll moment, an environmental charity dedicated to saving the oceans. According to those on the environmental charity circuit, the Terra Mar Project did nothing. <laughs> it was nothing more than a representative face, and it was dissolved in July 12th, 2019. Guess what that is? Just six days after Jeffrey Epstein was arrested. Now, Jelaine, where is Jelaine? Where is she today? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Jeffrey Epstein's dead. She's gone. Where is she? She is one of the people who not only facilitated the, 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 the relationships that he built with the rich and powerful, but also helped facilitate the sexual relationships that Jeffrey Epstein had with children. And she trained and these girls, basically. She trained them. She from, groomed them. Yeah, she the was, victims. in essence, a madam for these children. And by the way, we don't call them women. They're children. 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds, they're children. We're not going to sit here and call them, uh, we're not going to call it, it's slavery is what it is. It's human trafficking. It's human, it's, trafficking is even a watered down, uh, sterile clinical word there. I don't like that word. It's child sex slavery. And she's acting a, as a madam. Where is she? She's not dead. She's disappeared. After that, you remember that whole in and out paparazzi photo went viral? You got Jelaine, who's she's gone. She's out of the spotlight. Uh, she could be back in England, where she's got a dual citizen citizenship. But rumors are uh, also flying around that she is in Israel trying to find asylum. So why hasn't the FBI extradited Jelaine Maxwell back to the U.S. to face charges of child sex trafficking and slavery? These are the things that we're going to answer. These are the questions we're going to get into in these next parts. Candace. Yes. We've established the king. We've established the queen. We've established the bishops. So far, the bishops, the bishops are off the scene. Mm -hmm. The queen has been elusive, but she's still at large. The king, as we know, is physically dead, but his influence remains, which means there has been no checkmate. The game is still going on. On the stage here, we have Glenn Maxwell, founder and president of the Terra Mar Project, a nonprofit whose mission is to create a global ocean community to protect and promote sustainable development of the ocean. Ghislaine is easily one of the smartest, most fascinating people I've ever met. This is proven by the fact that she holds a bachelor's and master's degree from Oxford University, is a private helicopter pilot, a trained EMT, a qualified ROV, which I had to look up what that was, and a deep worker submarine pilot, in addition to being fluent in four languages. This is what I had written down before I realized that she spoke at the UN nine times since the last time I saw her. So with that, I'd like to welcome Glenn Maxwell. Thank you. Excellent. 
Good afternoon. Um, I noticed that my speech today was leveraging technology to create a global ocean community. I'm going to change that on you and I'm going to leverage technology to create a new country.